All right. Uh, geometry lesson 17. Uh, this picks up in your book on page 103. We're talking about more conditional statements. What we should know about conditional statements up to this point is that they are if-then statements. Okay, if this, then that. Uh, if hypothesis, then conclusion. All right, and we've learned about that stuff up to this point. Um, you know, so it's typically in the form of if P then Q, and I think we've we've already kind of looked at everything that we see here in this first paragraph. It's there for you. You've got it in your notes. Uh, you can read that. If you're missing anything from that, you can ask about it. But what we're going to talk about today is we're going to take those statements and we're going to flip them around to make different statements. Okay. The first thing you need to know about is negation. Negation means it's basically like if you took a positive number, uh, you made it negative. Right. That would be negation. Or uh, and that same thing applies if you had a negative number. Right. Negation is still to make it negative, but now I have two negatives. So what have I done with that number? I've made it positive, right? Because I've got a double negative that's going to make that positive. So negation doesn't just mean not. It means to make it the opposite of that statement. So basically, if we go back to our original, you know, kind of our basic conditional statement, which is um, if an animal is a horse, then it has four legs. Negation to that would be if an animal is not a horse, then it does not have four legs. Right, does that kind of make sense? Now, that statement doesn't have to be true. I just want you to understand the negation part of it. All right, so the symbol that they use for negation is the same symbol that we use for similarity. It's um, that right there. We put that in front of it to say not that. Okay. So negation of a statement is the opposite of that statement. Negation for statement P is not P and is written as with our little squiggle line P. Uh, I'm sure that there's a real technical name for what that line is. Um, I don't have that for you. So I would call it a similarity symbol, but in this case, it's our negation symbol. All right, so um, the negation of a pentagon is regular is a pentagon is not regular. We're just adding not to the phrase. But what I want you to understand is if we already had the statement, um, a pentagon is not regular, the negation of that is a pentagon is regular. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so we can already have not in it, and we can apply negation and take the not out of it. So negation doesn't always just mean not. Okay. All right, which brings us to what we call an inverse statement. An inverse statement takes my conditional statement and it puts not in front of both the hypothesis and the conclusion. Okay, kind of like what my earlier statement was. Uh, if an animal is a horse, then it has four legs. If I wanted the inverse of that statement, I would say if an animal is not a horse, then it does not have four legs. Okay? All right. Uh, let's see. So that is what is shown up here. And then we have what is called the converse of a conditional statement. Okay? Converse of a conditional statement is simply where I flip the... Uh, hypothesis and the conclusion. I think we've already kind of run into converse before. Yes? Basically, it's instead of saying if, I ha if hypothesis, then conclusion, I'm taking the conclusion, making it the hypothesis, taking the hypothesis, making it a conclusion. So if my statement is, if an animal is a horse, then it has four legs, the converse of that statement is, if an animal has four legs, then it is a horse. Do you follow me so far? Okay. Right, and we can look at these things mathematically to see if they're true, but the converse of a conditional statement and the inverse of the same conditional statement always have the same truth value. Either both are true or both are false. When two related conditional statements have the same truth value, they're referred to as logically equivalent statements, meaning if my inverse is, uh, if my inverse is true and my converse is true. All right. All right, so then that brings us to contrapositive. Contrapositive takes inverse and converse and does both of them at the same time. So if my statement was, if an animal is a horse, then it has four legs, becomes, if an animal does not have four legs, then it is not a horse. All right, see how I move the hypothesis to the conclusion, the conclusion to the hypothesis, and applied negation to both of them. Okay, so you're doing two things. 
you're flipping and you're negating with a contrapositive. So up here you see a little chart of what a statement might look like given just symbols. You know, if our original statement is if P then Q, our converse is if Q then P, our inverse is if not P then not Q. Uh, see the inverse does not change the order. It still goes P then Q. We're only applying negation. People, I, I have students every year that get these things confused, swapped, flip-flopped, or some combination of these things. So uh, I want you to un understand that we're not going from converse to inverse. Okay, in the inverse doesn't come from the converse. The inverse comes from the original statement. Okay, and the converse comes from the original statement. Okay, but both the converse and the inverse, okay, apply to contrapositive. If not Q, then not P. Okay. Does this make sense to us? Do we understand? All we're doing is we're just moving things around. Well, at this point, we have, there's not even any math involved. Okay. That brings us to lesson 18 and, of course, how Saxon works. It's not just like, you know, we're going to go from talking about conditional statements to something else that deals with conditional statements. Lesson 18 is triangle theorems. Okay. This is the math side of this lesson. Okay. The angles of a triangle have special relationships. The most basic relationship is given by the triangle angle sum theorem. And that says that the sum of all the angles of a triangle are going to add up to 180 degrees. How many of us knew that before we walked in today? A few of us? Okay. All right. So what you need to know is that all of the angles of a triangle, and there's only three, there will always be three, there will only ever be three angles to a triangle, they will always add up to be exactly, not less, not more, but exactly 180 degrees. And because the angles of a triangle will always add up to be exactly 180 degrees, we can use that to understand other parts. Okay? So, in this picture, measure angle A plus measure angle B plus measure angle C is going to equal 180 degrees. Okay, and this is important to understand because we're going to use this for proofs. We're going to use this for theorems. Um, we're going to use this in a lot of different ways. Okay. Because of that, we have what is called corollaries. Uh, corollaries to a theorem is a statement that follows directly from that theorem. In this case, the triangle angle sum theorem. So the triangle angle sum theorem has several useful corollaries. Because that we know that uh, a triangle is made up of three angles that add up to 180 degrees, we know these, I want to say just four things. There might be a fifth thing. I think it's just four things. All right, these are four things that you need to know. Okay? If you were going to write something down, these would be the four things you would want to write down. Okay, or keeping your notes somewhere. If two angles of one triangle are congruent to two angles of another triangle, then their third angles are congruent. Always. Okay, this is what we call the third angle theorem. Okay, if we're talking about it by itself. It means this, is that if I know one angle of a triangle is 45 degrees and it's equal to a 45 degree angle of another triangle, and then I've got a 55 degree angle on another triangle and I've got a 55 degree angle on another triangle, right? Okay, that's adding up between them is what, 100 degrees? 45 and 55 is 100. So we've spoken for 100 degrees for both of them. They each only have one angle left, correct? All right, and their angles have to total to be 180, which means what do we know their third angle is? If there's 180 degrees and we've already spoken for 100, 80. So I know angle 3 on our first triangle is 80. I know angle 3 on my second triangle is, is 80. So do we understand corollary 1? Okay. It forces it to have that third angle congruent. Second, the acute angles of a right triangle are complementary. Uh, let's see if I can make this make sense. If we have a right triangle, that means I have a right angle. How many degrees does that right angle have? 90 degrees. Okay, so that's 90 degrees. What is the sum of the angles of a triangle? 180, which means how many degrees do I have left between, let's say, angle 1 and angle 2? I have, I have 90 degrees. 
So two angles that add up to be 90 degrees are said to be what? Right, two angles that add up to be 90 degrees are complementary. So because 90 degrees is spoken for and I have to have 180 degrees in this triangle, 180 minus 90 leaves me with exactly 90 degrees and two angles, so I, they have to add up to be 90, which means those two other angles are complementary always, which is somewhat handy because if I know what, uh, let's say I know that this is 35 degrees, do I have to add 90 and 35 and subtract from 180 to find angle 1? No, I don't. Why not? It's complementary, so all I have to do is subtract 35 from what? 90. So I've saved myself at least a step, right? So instead of, I'm, I'm not having to add 90 and 35. Does this make sense? I could, and I would still get the same answer. I'm not trying to take anything away from you, right? If that's what you feel comfortable with doing, but I'm telling you that anything that's going to save me a step in math is my friend, okay? So all I have to do, instead of doing 90 plus 35, subtract that total from 180, all I have to do is go 90 minus 35, okay? Um, that's especially handy, Any in anything in math that helps me save time and do fewer steps is especially handy when some of you are looking at taking the ACT test in February, right? Or hopefully maybe sooner or more often, okay? So, you because you're talking about a time test there. All right, let's look at corollary three. The measure of each angle of an equal angular triangle is 60 degrees. All right, equiangular. Can anybody tell me what equiangular means? Equal angles, okay. How many angles does a triangle have? Three. What do they have to sum up to be? So if I take 180 and divide it by three, what am I going to get? 60. So an equal angular triangle is made up of three 60-degree angles. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. A triangle can have at most one obtuse, um, one right or one obtuse angle. Can't have more than one, okay. Uh, for instance, all right, let's say this uh, is 125 degrees, okay? Can I have another angle that's going to be greater than 90 degrees, all right? Even if it was 91, 91 plus 125 is already greater than 180. Even if it was a right triangle, okay, if this is 90, at most those can sum up to be 90, but what's the definition of I mean, I can't get another right angle in there. Between the two of them, they have to add up to that. So they're never going to be, you're not going to get a second right angle in a triangle. You're not going to get a second obtuse angle in a triangle. You'll only get one because you have a limited number of degrees. Okay, not enough angles, or sorry, not enough degrees to split them up. So each of these corollaries is a direct result of that triangle angle sum theorem. Um, and we've talked about, you know, this uh, example three is true because there's only three angles. Uh, they have to add up to 180 degrees, so 180 divided by three is 60. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think this might be our last slide. Uh, and this is called the remote interior angle uh, theorem. Uh, it's an interior angle that is not adjacent to an exterior angle. Basically, in our illustration down here, uh, DCA is an exterior, or I'm sorry, not, that's, a, that's our exterior angle, but angle A and angle B, okay, are remote interior angles to angle DCA, okay, because by definition it's an, it's an interior angle that's not adjacent to a given exterior angle, not adjacent, okay, if it was adjacent uh, angle ACB is the adjacent angle to DCA, right? Yes. Yeah, that's what you're going to find out because that's what this says right here. Um, that if I want to know what DCA is, that blue angle, I take angle A and angle B and add them up. Okay? That's what, I mean, so it's kind of handy. Uh, to know how to do that, 
right? Because I may not know what angle ACB is, right? Actually, I could find it fairly easy, right? I would just have to add up uh, angle A and angle B, subtract that from 180, find out what's left, right? And then because I know angle ACB is a linear pair with DCA, right, I would end up subtracting ACB from 180. But you see how many more steps are involved there, right? I've got to add up to, subtract from 180, right? And then subtract that from 180, Right, which is ultimately going to be the same as A and B. So instead of adding and subtracting multiple times, I can add two numbers together and be done. Okay. So the measure of each exterior angle of a triangle is equal to the sum of the measures of its two remote interior angles. All right. And remote interior is it's somewhat relative. It's based upon where that position is. For instance, if I drew this line out here, right? then the remote interior angles to this angle right here are actually here and here. Okay, so if I want to know what that blue angle is, I'm going to have to add up those two red angles, the two angles that are not adjacent to that exterior angle. Do you follow me? Okay. All right, let's see what else we've got, if anything. That's it. All right, let's see if I can pull up some work for us to do. Okay, we are at 17.18. We'll answer some questions for about 10 minutes. You got a question, Mike, or are you just stretching? No? Okay. All right. Question number one, uh, these are going to deal with that lesson 17. Uh, write the inverse of the statement. If a, uh, if a figure is a square, then it has four sides. What does inverse mean? What am I doing with that? Am I flipping it or negating it? Negating it, right? Do I negate both the hypothesis and the conclusion, just the hypothesis or just the conclusion? Both. All right, so I want something that says if a figure is what? Not a square, then it does not have four sides, okay? Um, do we know what's wrong with A? It's flipped and negated. So A is a contrapositive, not an inverse. Uh, B is our answer. Um, let's see, C is the converse. It just flips it. Um, let's see, I think, um, actually, no, C, C uh, does flip it, but then applies negation there, um, and then this is just our converse there. So we want B as our answer. Okay. Um, let's see, number two is a really good question, but I think you ought to be able to answer it kind of on your own. Uh, if an well, we'll answer it. If an animal is a bird, then it has two eyes. Uh, what's the converse of that? What do I do whenever I'm finding the converse? Flipping, negating, doing uh, doing both. Okay, I flip it. So, um, tell me about the flip of that. If an animal is a bird, then it has two eyes. So, if very good. All right. If an animal has two eyes, then it is a bird. That's the converse. What about the inverse? Kitty, what do you think? The inverse. What do I do with the inverse? Am I flipping it or negating it whenever I do the inverse? Mm, go back to look at your notes. Negating it. Negating it means but we're going to add not. But are we going to change the order? No, we leave the order the same. So if an animal, let's, let's just, I'm not even looking at the options down here. Let's just look at this statement. If I'm going to negate it, if an animal is not a bird good, then, then it does, does not have two eyes good. All right, that's the inverse. All right, contrapositive. Jose, can you tell me about the contrapositive? What do I do with that? Okay, 
So I'm going to start by looking first at this, right? And using negation. So if an animal, good, if an animal does not have two eyes, then, then it is not a bird. Good. I, you guys got the right answers. We talked about that. I don't, I'm not looking through and seeing which A, B, C, or D is correct. You guys can figure that out. All right, let's look at number three. Find the angle measures uh, in this scalene triangle. So in a scalene triangle, um, all the angles are going to be different. Okay? So if I'm going to set this up, I'm going to set up using the triangle angle sum theorem. All right, which means everything should add up to what? 180. So can I literally just write one long equation? Yeah. All right. What am I going to write? Jose, or sorry, uh, Jordan, help me out. What am I going to write? Uh, what does everything add up to? 180. 180. So. Uh, exactly right. We don't necessarily need the parentheses around it because we're going to add everything up. So. Let's combine like terms. What like terms can I add together? X and, OK, what's x plus x? No, that's multiplication. x times x is x squared. There you go, 2x. All right, anything else I can combine? And get 80. So 2x plus 80 equals 180. OK, what's next? Subtract 80. So I get 2x equals what? Two x equals what? But I thought you subtracted 80 from 180. 100. Okay. So now divide by two. What does x equal? 50. All right. But our question was, find the angle measure. So 50 only works in one spot, right? Right there, that's 50. OK, so what do we know that to be? 50 plus 20 is 70. So now I know my angles are 60, 50, and 70. I'm really just looking for that right there, right? OK, does that make sense? All right, don't make this harder than it has to be. It's fairly simple, but you don't get lost in it. All right, number four. We'll do this question because this question does show up on tests. All right, there's a number of kind of different ways to look at it. I'm going to tell you how I typically solve this question. Let's see if. Um, let's see, let's move this back up again. All right. Basically, what we are looking for, we want to see what our question actually is. It says find measure angle ECD. So we want to know what that angle right there is. Okay? What I typically do with this is the first thing I do is I find that angle right there. Right? Then I add it to that angle there, and then I subtract all of that from 180. We can do it that way. You can also use, I believe, um, i trying to think there's, there's another way to do it. Because, let me explain this too. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to look at, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of the right way to explain this. You can use remote interior angles to solve this, but I'm trying to remember exactly how you want to do that. In any case, well, let's go ahead and do it just the normal way um, and find our first angle. If I stop having a brain fart, I might remember the other way to do it. All right, so 61 plus 22 is what? Uh, 
what do I get when I add those up? 83. All right, so I got 83 degrees there. If I want to find the third angle, what do I need to do? How do I find that? Okay, subtract it from 180. Okay. I get 97 degrees, correct? Okay. If I add it to that, right, so we take 97 plus 42. All right, that's giving you what, 139? Okay. And all of this is a linear pair. So I could take 139, or I could take 180 and subtract 139 from it. Right, and I should get 41 degrees. Okay. Do we follow that at all? Okay. Use what you know. Okay, like I said, you'll see that on a test. What's risky about me telling you that this is going to be on a test is that a lot of students will have a tendency to memorize 41 degrees, right, but then can't show the work. Are you going to get credit if you can't explain how to get 41 degrees? Right, you won't get credit. Now, on test corrections day, you can go back and watch the video and figure out how to get 41 degrees, but by that time, you're only getting a third of a point, okay, which is not nothing, but far better to get the whole point. Okay. Any other questions that we have before we close this out? Do you want to see another triangle question or want to see another conditional statement question? All right. I guess silence means no. I'll stop here. You guys can get started on your homework.